Great. So thank you, Mihalis, and welcome everybody. Appreciate your your time and interest in Matinas Biopharma. Our I'll be giving a short update on our lead clinical stage asset, which is our oral amphotericin B MAT2203. But before I do that, I'll give you a little bit of background of our company, just so you understand how our, our lead clinical asset fits, fits into our overall uh, clinical strategy. So Matinas Biopharma is a drug delivery platform wherein we are developing and um, utilizing a uh, novel lipid nanocrystal uh, phosphatidylserine and calcium-based drug delivery platform that allows us in a targeted manner to leverage the activated cells, in our case of the immune system, to target the delivery of drug to, in our case, the, the site of infection in a way that is non-destructive to target cells and is facilitated through a fusogenic uh, process that leverages the phosphatidylserine that is a key component of our lipid nanocrystal drug delivery platform. And what differentiates our drug delivery platform from LNPs is the lack of any immunogenicity or adverse immune response with the leveraging of our platform for the delivery of the drug payload and the product that I'll be talking about this morning is our oral amphotericin. We've been able to demonstrate that utilizing our drug delivery platform, we have reduced toxicity and the flexibility to leverage our platform to deliver a broad range of molecules that include small molecules, as well as peptides, proteins, and nucleic acids. We've also demonstrated in preclinical study the ability to leverage our platform in the vaccine space. What we are currently very pleased to be able to share is data from our ongoing clinical trial, the ENACT trial, that has shown uh, for us the ability to orally deliver amphotericin across the blood-brain barrier, not only in animal models, but now in patients that are ongoing in the ENACT trial. And I'll talk a little bit about the study design in a few minutes. And our platform has in fact been validated now, not only in preclinical studies, but also in uh, the clinical setting. We have uh, two clinical stage assets that we are delivering, leveraging our, our platform, our oral amphotericin B product, which I'll talk in more detail in a, in a couple of slides time, as well as an oral amicacin uh, delivery for the treatment of non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection, which we are developing in partnership with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, which we are now advancing into the clinic with an ongoing uh, clinical trial, a single ascending dose study in healthy volunteers with a goal of going into patient trials next year. We also have some ongoing uh, preclinical collaborations with NIH, Genentech, and other biotech companies leveraging uh, potentially the expansion of our platform more broadly beyond infectious diseases. So turning attention specifically to our MAT2203, which was discussed during uh, Andre Speck's presentation, MAT2203 is our oral amphotericin B formulation that utilizes our lipid nanocrystal technology. We have been able to demonstrate in an ongoing study that we are in fact able to deliver amphotericin orally across the blood-brain barrier based on some very compelling clinical data that we recently shared with the FDA in a meeting we had with them um, back in December. Our formulation of MAT2203 allows us to orally deliver and improve upon the toxicity seen with IV delivered amphotericin due to the targeted nature of our drug delivery platform. So by targeting the delivery via macrophage delivery to the site of infection, we are able to bypass the high systemic exposure that you see with IV delivered amphotericin, thereby allowing for um, a safety profile that, that would support long-term use. And this in fact has been clinically studied in a, a small patient population at the NIH in which we've been able to treat patients for over four years 
with no signs of, of any renal toxicity, albeit a, a small handful of patients, but, but the safety continues to be borne out uh, with our oral delivery platform. The ENACT study that is currently ongoing in Uganda is assessing the potential utility of our oral amphotericin product initially as step down to IV amphotericin after just two days of administration of IV, stepping down to our oral MAT2203 with the continuation of MAT2203 treatment through the first four weeks of consolidation. The design of the next study is sequential in that we are slowly transitioning patients from an IV, pro, IV induction treatment to step down to oral MAT2203 and then ultimately through to cohort four in which we are testing an all oral induction regimen of our oral MAT2203 through consolidation treatment. Our oral MAT2203 is given in, in conjunction with 5FC, the standard of care comparator arm is IV amphotericin plus 5FC administered through day seven with a transition of patients to high dose fluconazole. The study is ongoing and we are now enrolling cohort four, which is assessing an all oral regimen for the treatment of, of crypto. Just from a high level, the data that we have been able to demonstrate to date for cohort four, which was our key cohort testing the ability to step down after only two days of IV amphotericin, has shown an EFA of 0 0.42, which has shown to be uh, better than the oral fluconazole historical 0 0.2 EFA that was our primary endpoint comparison we were not powered for statistical comparison to the standard of care arm. Our primary analysis was relative to oral fluconazole. And we were able to demonstrate in this cohort that after step-down therapy, we were able to have an improvement of EFA, an improvement which translates into significantly better survival and clinical outcome. And in fact, the survival rate that we've seen in this cohort overall has been 90% at 18 weeks and early survival at day 30, we have uh, greater than 97% uh, versus standard of care in our trial was 76%. So we're very pleased with these data. These data were shared with the FDA and we have agreed, uh, we have a preliminary agreement for uh, uh, confirming these results in a, a, an additional potential cohort in the ENACT trial that will replicate the design and uh, be a non-inferiority comparison to standard of care in a subsequent fifth cohort, which we hope would, would be sufficient to support registration of this product as step-down therapy in cryptococcal meningitis. Um, from a safety perspective, We've, we've been able to demonstrate that MAT2203 is safe and well tolerated. We have seen no signs of renal toxicity, uh, no major safety signals and no treatment limiting tolerability issues, uh, which we believe would support the a broader utility of MAT2203 beyond just cryptococcal meningitis, potentially looking at uh, studies in prophylaxis as well as other invasive fungal infections which we hope to be able to um, plan in, in the, the coming months and years ahead as we look to expand our development program. So just in, in summary, the, the cohort two results that we've demonstrated really for us are, are highly meaningful to be able to transition a drug from IV to an oral uh, formulation that can target an infection can uh, cross the blood-brain barrier and limit the, the, the toxicity associated with IV use is really uh, very important for us, um, for amphotericin, as well as for our second lead asset, um, our oral amicacin, and more broadly for our platform as we look to, to potentially expand its utility in, in more um, additional novel innovative therapies. So that's really the, the highlights from my presentation. I'll stop sharing now and would welcome any questions you might have.
thanks so much, Terry, for sharing this uh, uh, exciting uh, uh, data. Uh, so uh, the, we have uh, uh, Haran, Jennifer, and uh, Marisa here. So I, I would like to just give them the opportunity to ask any questions uh, as a starting uh, point. So, yeah, I have a question. I actually a couple of questions, but the first question would be, um, is it um, any um, future on doing uh, like uh, a salvage uh, trial for diseases uh, such as uh, mucor, you know, that uh, this uh, of posterium or, or these infections that patients probably only can be treated with IV and photericin, uh, and then probably is it difficult drug to send the patient home, right? And then transition them to the oral formulation of AMFO. Yeah, that's a great question. We're actually, um, as we speak, working on a, 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 a proposal with uh, Dr. Ashraf Ibrahim to explore the preclinical um, potential utility of our drug in the treatment of mucormycosis in his uh, mouse model. So we are, absolutely interested in, in pursuing um, these these more um, the high high mortality uh, high high resistant um, fungal infections we also will be working with um, David Perlin to continue to elaborate our data package for C Oris and do in the medium uh, term hope to start uh, initiating a invasive fungal infection basket study that will include patients with mucor, aspergillosis, cioris, and, and others as we continue to build upon our preclinical package. And I welcome Heron for you to provide your insight as a key member of our team at Matinez providing us his medical input. Right, Th thanks very much, Terry. I mean, it's, as I've said multiple times to you, it's really exciting for me to be part of this project that can, uh, you know, potentially result in an oral formulation of uh, AMFO that can be used for exactly what, uh, Marissa, you're suggesting as continued treatment with AMFO for patients that have invasive fungal infections where there really is no step down oral option. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, we can definitely uh, talk to you about the opportunity of, uh, you know, uh, helping us on that study going forward, because uh, yeah, we agree that that's a real opportunity for this drug to be used. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the other question I had, actually, it's not a question, but I was, as you guys were presenting and I was hearing about all this, it's like uh, how difficult it is to have a real endpoint uh, for these studies, right? Because um, you cannot, um, I mean, besides using like uh, mortality or clinical response, but at the same time you are using adjuvants. So it's like, how do you really, um, you know, because at some point we, if you do a trial and everything it's like, well, you had to have a, a good selling point, but the selling point in the sense of you want people to participate on the study, right? So yeah. what are the, um, so how do you see uh, those endpoints being more tangible? You know what I'm saying? It's like uh, uh, more than, okay, mortality or, you know, response, but because things can go wrong or right, but some, but um, you need something more tangible, more than you can count, right? And particularly when you, um, are, so it's like, I'm not sure even if a drug monitoring is an option here, you know, like a, a PK yeah. studies are an option because what are you comparing to when you are using so much lower dose, right? And your uh, delivery site is different. Sorry. Yeah, these are so <laughs> questions. Maybe I'll start in here and please, you know, so we just came out of an FDA meeting and and they were fairly clear that they they really expect mortality to, to be the endpoint. You know, EFA is something that for us has been an important biomarker, if you will, of our antifungal activity. And we continue to monitor our, our you know, our, our fungal counts very closely. And it is a key secondary endpoint for us, but mortality from a regulatory perspective will likely be the endpoint that we land on for our pivotal cohort of ENACT. 
but you, you raise an excellent point and it's something that we struggle with on the antibiotic development side as well. So it's, uh, it's really hard with, with the agencies um, kind of, they're, they're very wed, wedded to the, the mortality endpoint. And so that's something that, you know, continues for us. We believe that, that day 30 mortality will, will be an, a, a end point that we will be able to, we think, support, but it is a, a challenge. And Heron, maybe if you want to share your thoughts. Yeah, right. Absolutely. I, th I think uh, in cryptococcal meningitis, we've gotten clear feedback that uh, they're most interested in an early mortality outcome. Uh, 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 but if we're talking about, uh, you know, the step down approach that uh, Marissa, you were, you asked about a couple of minutes ago, that's where we're going to have to do some, you know, get some good feedback from people like you and the rest of the MSG and get feedback from the uh, FDA in terms of what are the most relevant endpoints in a study where Clearly, the patient must have had some response to the initial treatment with IV AMFO before switching to oral AMFO. On the other hand, there's got to be some clear benefits of, uh, you know, the treatment with oral AMFO after the switch. I, I think we can learn from the Abrexafungerp experience where they did get uh, FDA feedback on the design and endpoints of their step-down study. So that could be a sort of starting point for us, but you're absolutely right. We've got to put our heads together to think about what are the most important and most clinically relevant endpoints in a study of uh, MAT2203 is stepped down in patients with uh, fungal infections that have no other oral options. May I ask, uh, the, the, the design of uh, cohort four is already only cochleated on for B. And then you alluded to cohort five, which I, I deduced that it's going to be uh, either cochleated on for B or IV, uh, like conventional on for B with 5FC throughout without any so head-to-head -head comparison, is that is that what the plan That's is? That's correct, then, uh, uh, as mortality, step down. Mortality yeah. and EFA as uh, uh, endpoints? So um, we're early or early survival, so 30-day mortality, and then EFA would be secondary. Because then that would be a non-inferiority. I, I 100%, just, uh, yes. So, I mean, as you alluded, that, that would be a compelling, if that would be the result, right? I think that would... Uh, you know, uh, again, I'm not at FDA, but I would I would I would think that that would be very strong evidence for for a label, as you suggested. But also, it would probably open the door to not necessarily studying this as a step down, but like you know, upfront comparing this uh, uh, to to uh, parenteral formulations of amphotericin B as opposed to uh, in, induction with that. And then, uh, uh, is that is that your Yes, yes. So cohort four is text testing that all oral. So those those two cohorts will run staggered, but but you know, we, we don't have to wait for one to submit uh, the other. So we believe that once we have data from cohort four, if we're able to register a step down therapy, FDA would be more open to an all oral regimen because we have that foundation set. And so far, cohort three was a pilot in which we looked at five days of just oral MAT-2203 with 5-FC. And, and the EFAs were, were greater than the 0 0.2 and, and we had um, continued to see good survival. So we'll see in the larger cohort if an all oral regimen continues to bear out what we've seen with step down. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, when you first see it, the NAC study looks a little complicated. It takes a little while to understand what the various cohorts are. But uh, you know, cohort two was where we demonstrated that the early step down from IV AMFO to oral KMB was associated with an acceptable EFA and mortality. And as Terry mentioned, uh, we just, we presented those data to the FDA, and they were very. Uh, encouraging about moving uh, that forward into a phase three clinical trial. So that's our starting point is testing uh, rapid step down from IV AMFO to oral AMFO for the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. As Terry mentioned, our stage four of the study is actually looking at an all oral from the very beginning uh, treatment of uh, 
cryptococcal meningitis, and that may also turn out to generate encouraging data that we can take forward too. But uh, you know, we think that the step down uh, has great. Uh, potential uh, and and can also uh, lead the way to uh, step early step down in patients with other fungal infections. I think related to that, the the, the, the question that comes to my mind, uh, and in your slide there, Terry, you had different doses in the different cohorts, both at the induction and the consolidation phase. And you know, in our NIH uh, mucosal study, the dose was much lower. lower. So I wonder whether you guys are closer to, def to, to, to locking on what you think would be uh, an appropriate uh, dose for invasive disease. I mean, I would, I would think cryptomeningitis uh, efficacy would be a pretty good uh, readout for you know, many other infections uh, or, or caused by invasive, uh, invasive uh, fungal disease. But do you think uh, we know yet? Do you, is there something you could elaborate more? Yeah, so definitely for cryptococcal meningitis, our target dose will be 1.8 grams per day for induction with a step down to 1.2 grams per day for early consolidation. Um, we, we believe that it'll probably be in the dose range for other IFIs, uh, still to be determined based on the, the animal data. But the, the good news for us is there, there is no dose limiting toxicity. Um, we do have some GI tolerability early on if we push the unit dose too high, but the overall total daily dose, we don't see any uh, kidney issues or, or issues related to any other uh, biochemical you know, toxicity signals. I would just add very quickly for, uh, I think uh, 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 Haran knows that, but uh, Marisa uh, probably hasn't heard that. So the, the, again, small number of patients, but four patients who got uh, cochlear adenovirus in be here for over four years at the NIH, the, they, has, they had absolutely zero uh, uh, renal potassium or uh, hemoglobin issues uh, uh, while they uh, responded to treatment uh, clinically and also they were Detectable, uh, consistently good levels uh, in the in the plasma without much of excretion in the urine, which likely explains uh, uh, the, that. But four years uh, cumulative daily uh, uh, exposure to amphotericin in, in four subjects uh, resulted in no uh, late emergence of uh, renal toxicity. So I think I think that's uh, extremely encouraging. Obviously, from that standpoint, uh, Michael is uh, also the. Uh, one of the first parts of the ANAC study was to identify the maximum tolerated dose in patients with or with a history of cryptococcal meningitis. And so I think that's where we were able to push the dose up higher than what you used in your study. And, and you know, if, if that's the dose that's tolerated in patients with cryptococcal meningitis, it's pretty likely to be the same dose uh, for other fungal infections. So I think that'll be a good starting point for and, us. And it doesn't sound to me from your early data that you're worried that there is, this is the level that can be tolerated but might not be optimal for efficacy. It sounds like uh, uh, you know pushing further is not what uh, seems to be needed, at least in this early uh, experience you've had. That's correct. Right. And as Terry mentioned, that dose was associated with efficacy based on uh, the uh, EFAs and the survival in patients who got that dose in the early stages of the study. Any other questions uh, uh, from the group as we get close to uh, uh, end of time for our session? I mean, I. I would quickly add to say that, you know, I think what we know from uh, both teoxicolate and liposomal amphotericin B, it's not like we need to go up to 10 or 15 mix per kg a day in order to have efficacy. So you, you start getting toxicity as opposed to actually uh, delivering that. So, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, if uh, the current dosing for crypto meningitis, which is a severe disease, including the CNS, uh, appears to, uh, uh, to do the trick clinically, I think that would probably be sufficient for Fusarium or uh, other other infections that Marisa mentioned earlier, where I think a lot of us are even also excited because we see more of those infections in our country here, at least compared to mm -hmm. 
crypto, where obviously the need global is is, is immense. Yeah, no, to me, it's like uh, thinking about histoplasmosis or blasto, where you need to start, you know, those patients with, uh, let's say, a solid organ transplant that is developed, disseminated um, yeah. histo, but then you have the limiting factor of the, you know, the kidney function. You don't want them to fail the graft. So this would be a wonderful option because the problem with these patients is that many times you have to sh cut short the the time that you expose them to AMFO because of the toxicities, right? And then they had failure eventually, right? Um, because you transition too soon to um, to ITRA. So yeah, no, this is great. Well, we would love to to discuss more with you, Marissa, as we you know elaborate our further plans. We'd love to to get your input, as well as Mahalis, of course. Sure. Okay. Now this was great. We we you know the the fewer the merrier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. More time to more time actually to go through uh, all all of the good questions. So right, right. Well, Terry, thank you so much. Uh, thank and, you, everybody. Uh, and they will uh, return us all to the main room in just about a second. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.